Well, good morning, farmer. Welcome, everyone. We are recording, and I just want to say good morning. I hope everyone's having a great morning and on this March 16th. And anyway, um, the topic today, let's see what we got on deck. First of all, I just want to make sure that we're uh, everyone feels that uh, it's justice for all and that uh, everyone is uh, treated very fairly, I think, from the University of Maryland and, and for all, from all of our government agencies. And so I just want to make sure we're aware of that. But uh, GMO, genetically modified organisms, and where are we headed? And so that's the topic for Good Morning Farm this morning. I will like, record this first portion and then uh, we'll go into discussion after that. But I think I have some things that uh, will hopefully uh, bring you up to speed on what's going on and maybe a little bit of history of how it, uh, how it began. And, uh, and then we'll, we'll together we'll contemplate uh, where it's headed in our discussion. Again, my name is Dave Myers and there's a picture of the Ann Arbor County Extension Office. And, uh, and uh, again, having these Good Morning Farmer series uh, this year to uh, uh, kind of topical, maybe some really good areas of interest. The, um, I know I maybe I've shared this slide in Good Morning Farmer before, but uh, I really am, uh, I do believe that there's gonna be this amazing resurgence of, of agriculturalists. And I know that because uh, the, the aging of the, uh, the farming population and the, just the explosion of technology that's occurring in agriculture, I think it's pretty exciting. And I think we're gonna see a really interesting gen ag uh, blossom here pretty soon to take on these needs of feeding the world. And so I'm excited about this generation that's coming and the opportunities that they have in agriculture and feeding us. Of course, University of Maryland Extension, kind of my slogan, every farmer a better farmer. And I think that's what Extension does and helps uh, every farmer become a better farmer. The land grant system has, has been powerful system for change and for advancement. And uh, you know, I think back on all of us can think back our grandparents, our great grandparents and what they had to endure in agriculture. And again, it is pretty exciting to think about that new generation that's coming and what um, what excitement there should be around it. Pest control strategies, I think, have a lot to do with the genetic. I'm going to probably say genetic engineering more than I say genetically modified. I like the idea that we're engineering this change and that this change is has a course. And um, so with genetic engineering, I think it's a little bit more powerful term, probably a little more precise uh, to what's being done at the genetic level with our crops and even into the future, probably our livestock. But pest control is the reason I think we've seen uh, pest management uh, is the reason why we've seen this, this shift and change. It really is difficult um, as farmers uh, to produce crops without a lot of loss uh, uh, to pests, whether it's competition from weeds or direct uh, assault by insects and mites or, or whether disease comes in. And what we do know that pest control strategies have a lot of components, natural control, applied control, what humans do, maybe with the applications of pesticides or other cultural techniques. Of course, it's always been about pick, picking the best genetics of the plants and animals that we use. Integrated pest management uh, tries to bring all these tactics together. We've seen emergence of new biointensive and emerging technologies and even biorational approaches. I think that's driven a lot by our organic movement, um, kind of really paying attention to that nat those natural mechanisms and trying to find those avenues too. But transgenic, that's what we're gonna talk about this morning. That really is the, the I think, uh, the one that is really gonna be the driver of the change into the future. Again, very exciting, uh, very exciting technology. i share with you before some of these technical papers from CAST, and this one always comes to my mind um, when it talks about pest management, especially in the role of pesticides um, in meeting the, the food challenges of the past and today and even into the future. And it's just a great opportunity. If you haven't read this one, um, CAST issue paper number 55, uh, it really is, it came out in 2014. It really does give you a great synopsis of the role of pesticides. And it even mentions genetics uh, as uh, the kind of the, 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 the new direction. You know, I, I like, I put this slide together a few years ago. It's kind of this idea of, you know, uh, letters or, you know, elements make chem chemistry. And you can look at the periodic table and look at all those elements and be fascinated by all the different substances. And then you also know that um, you know uh, these same elements uh, are used in the biochemical world to to uh, to cause change. And we we might I like to think of uh, plant protection chemicals better than pesticides. Maybe we should even think of them as plant medicines. You know, it's amazing we put the same advantage, which is um, imidacloprid chemistry, on our dog and cat, and it's a medicine, but we put it on our tomato, and it's a pesticide. 
And in reality, we're doing the same thing with both for controlling insects systemically. So again, it really is fascinating as we kind of think about that and think about 26 letters that make all those words that make all that those books in the Library of Congress and everything that's you know been collected, the largest collection in the in the world, it's right here in, in Washington in, in books and and it's just incredible to think about what the future is just in each the realm of each right. And I like to think that we can add gene, the understanding of genes and the sequences of genes, kind of as letters. Um, and that's part of the genome, right? Um, the sequence of, of amino, amino, essential amino acid compounds and, and protein, um, you know, uh, as we get into translation, transcription, all the terms they use in genetics, you know. Um, and here we are, just kind of like the same thing, like, like editing words and editing chemicals. Here we are editing the genome. And so again, it really is just a better understanding. You know, it's, it's science that uh, is moving fast and furious, but at the same time, it's just fascinating. So anyway, Cass wrote a paper called Genome Editing in uh, July of 2018, issue paper number 60. And it's, it's another great read on, on just the accomplishments of, of the gen genetic engineering that has come to date to that point. Of course, we can't talk about genetics without going to a little homework here. But you know, we really have, you know, this, this so much more understanding now of, of this DNA. And you think, you know, it's just incredible, you know, to think that it's just these repeating pairs, um, uh, you know, of, of this essentials, adenine, thymine, guanine, and cysteine that create all the different 20 essential, uh, 20 amino acids that are needed in our body. And just incredible to think that and everything is coded for all the proteins that make us who we are. And, uh, and so again, very incredible. But again, it, it all comes down, maybe you've seen the DNA codon um, table and it shows you how those, those four, um, adenine, cysteine, thymine, and guanine, how they, each one of those makes the 20 essential proteins that's in our body. And then you, so you go back to basic genetic science and it's all coded in that, in, within our chromosomes. And chromosome is a, you know, a combination of the two parents. And then uh, those creates those uh, gene gene uh, sequences on the DNA code. You know that only about 2% of what's on our actual DNA in each cell actually functions to produce uh, the proteins and things that make us who we are. The rest of it's kind of considered, they call it junk, <laughs> which, <laughs> so junk DNA, uh, you know, but it does, even that does code for, for, for different activities in the body, but doesn't produce proteins that are essential to building you who you are. And uh, then we get into the understanding of how, you know, we, uh, DNA, uh, um, of course, it, it, uh, it transcripts and becomes uh, more DNA, but uh, with uh, uh, RNA polymerase, so we see the separation of RNA and they're running through the rhizome, and that's how we get the protein factory to work. So it really is. So genetic science is just a full appreciation. Here's the 20 common amino acids that are coded and on that codon wheel that we just looked at. And, uh, and then you can see how it's coded um, on that codon wheel. So if you go back to that wheel, it's really interesting. So uh, let's just take proline here. You know, if the code on that would be C, C, um, T, P. And so again, you go, and so that's how you can look back. Actually, C, it's actually three, repeats three. So C, C, T, C, 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 A, C, C, G. And so if you look at proline, if you look a little bit closer at proline on here, um, you'll see that you see those three sets of um, repeats uh, of the basically code for that essential amino acid. So again, really, really fascinating. So just that little history kind of, that's where we're dealing with. We're dealing with those, those sequences and codes and causing change to that to get the change, drive the change that we want in the crop. The amazing thing is, is this, this is a really great paper if you haven't read it. Um, it's a genetically engineered crop. It's a very good summary put out by um, um, Paul Vigeli from the University of Kentucky. I really love, love this paper. It's about, he goes through about uh, 20 points within this paper um, of kind of, he talks about all the uh, kind of the, maybe some controversial subjects about, about GNA, DNA and genetic engineering. And then he, he, kind, of, he kind of helps you understand uh, maybe where the controversy lies, but also he goes deep within um, how each one of the, these genetically engineered crops that have really impacted us uh, were designed and developed. And I think just for a very short paper, I think he does a lot to kind of help us see how it evolved. And so I really highly recommend uh, from the University of Kentucky, Paul Vincelli's work called Genetically Engineered Crops. 
and reading through his 17 points of, of production. The first one he starts with is that it naturally occurs. So, you know, genetically modification, we've stu studied the genomes and uh, it really is, we're finding a, a lot of naturally occurring gene editing that's going on and even gene swapping that we really didn't think was true uh, before um, the, we got into the 80s. And so this, these are fairly 1980s, you know, we really started to understand this science and, and develop it. And look, studying genomes re really readily started to realize that the natural world has been doing a lot of this. We just hadn't figured it out. And so now they figured it out and they figured it out by using things like agrobacterium and viruses and things and started to understand how they could actually insert, silence, delete, turn off, you know, these different mechanisms within our own, you know, within genetics and, and create and modify things uh, within the direction they wanted to. And so again, uh, sweet potatoes were found to be naturally modified by agrobacterium, kind of the superstar of gene manipulation. So that was where they really started in, in the 1980s um, was the, the period. So here's a little timeline. I thought maybe we'd look at that. Of course, we can go back 10,000 years of history and see that domestication was a very start of genetic science. Uh, we started to understand Mendel's laws of, of hereditary around uh, in the 1800s, 1900s was applied. And then um, it's really interesting, the uh, hybridization came in around the early 1900s, uh, before 1920, and uh, started to understand uh, this property called mutagenicity. Gen and they actually started to do um, mutagenetic science where they would use radiation. Um, and they still do, to some extent, uh, radiate seeds to, to manipulate um, uh, genetic change. And so again, of course, natural radiation in the world does similar things too. In the, um, and so they uh, started playing around with that quite a bit. And they, under, they didn't really understand what they were doing, but they knew it worked. They knew that they were impacting, just like Gregory Mendel didn't understand genes, but he knew they were there. Um, and so again, then eventually you get to Watson and Crick in uh, 53, discovery of the DNA helix, actually seeing it with the electron microscope and actually, actually able to segregate it out with those enzymes. And again, really quickly from then and into de deciphering genetic code and understanding recombinant DNA technology, and that was in the 60s, late 60s. 1970, it understood things like, uh, started to think about engineering and transgenics as early as 1970. Really didn't happen until early 80s. The first genetically modified crop was actually tobacco. They used agrobacterium um, to start to uh, actually uh, uh, just do a little bit of gene editing. And uh, I think, I forget, they, they made a virus uh, resistant tobacco was the first. Never made it to the market, but was certainly the first discovery. Um, so we got into, in, interesting, in the 80s, they came out with the gene gun, they called ballistic of technology and agromediated, where we start doing callus and petri dish stuff. And I remember being in the agronomy room and talking about the gene gun and how most of them were scoffers at the time. Um, but, yeah, but lo and behold, and even they almost gave up, Monsanto almost gave up on the gene gun in their tries to get Roundup Ready technology and soybeans. And almost at the last hour before they pulled the plug, they did it in the late 80s. And of course, the first crops came in being in the 90s. And we'll look at that. We get into more interesting things now since the 1990s, um, RNA AI and gene sequencing, uh, ZFN, all these uh, different uh, uh, kind of tilling the DNA and into CRISPR, Talon was one of the first and CRISPR technology. Some of these, using some of these mechanisms like viruses and bacteria and viroids and different things of that to start to understand how to open the DNA molecule where they want to, which is really fascinating to think about. So just kind of neat science and the kind of gradually bringing into being this, this, this kind of what we saw in the field, uh, genetically engineered crops, GMOs. And again, kind of here another timeline, you can see that as that occurs um, in 1990s is when we first saw the genetic crops hit the marketplace and squash and soybeans were the, the first and um, the, uh, although they had been developed, those things had been developed back in the uh, late 80s and 90s. Um, they didn't make it, they took about 10 years, right? To make sure this, this technology was safe to get it actually into the hands of growers. Uh, 1997, papaya was a big, big thing around the world. Uh, that was given for free, you know? So all of these, some of, most of these came with technology fees to the grower. I remember I was a decob dealer in 1995 when the first bags were coming available. Uh, for a trial and we we're able to give some out to growers. 1996, about 20% of what I sold was genetically modified soybeans that Roundup could be applied over the top. Of course, Roundup 
and the BT corn came out and, uh, and it came out around 96, 97 too. And so we started to see uh, these major players, these major crops. And most recently in 2016, we got potatoes and apples in 2000, uh, uh, also 2017. So we got some new players here. We're starting to see vegetables now coming to the market. And they've been doing a lot of work in vegetables that just haven't been accepted. BT potatoes came out in the 90s, late 90s too, but that wasn't accepted. Uh, it was unfortunately during that period when there was a lot of talk about Franken food and a lot of concern and, and Lay's potatoes said, no, we're not going to have our potato chips, BT. We can have our corn and our <laughs> soybeans, but not our potato chips. And so interesting uh, turn of events sometimes as we see, as we've seen this play out over time. Not much resistance to GMO in the world right now. And actually we're seeing it uh, incredible uh, acceptance. And I'll, sh I'll show you some slides about that in just a minute. But CRISPR, this really exciting technology, it really, you can kind of get into the detail here of how we can actually get you know, at the gene level uh, now and make, make changes. And not just, not always are we adding, you know, we can actually uh, edit, you know, we can turn off um, cis, cis, uh, cis uh, 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 transgenetic and cisgenetic alterations. Cisgenetic is within the same species. Transgenetic is without, so genes with outside of the species. And so again, it really is, um, you know, just fascinating. Here's just some examples here. Kind of can't really read the print, but just the number of crops that are being worked on even right now that we're probably going to see come into the pipeline pretty quickly. I think there's going to be a demand, a big dynamic change in the number of genetically crops probably within the next decade that are, come, that are going to come into the marketplace. The option of genetically engineered crops in the U.S., you know, how do we, where do we find the data? I always go back to USDA or ERS, Economic Research Service arm of the USDA, that's where they collect the stats and the statistics and data on, on these type of economic advancements. And, uh, and so again, we can look at the adoption in, in 96, 98 of, of the, typically the crops we think of, soybeans, cotton, and corn, and then just watch that ride up until we get to, you know, by the by time we get to, uh, you know, 2010 or so, we're really pushing up towards the most of the, the production of being the genetically modified crop. Here's the crops that are currently being grown in the U.S. And, and uh, we got apples and potatoes now, uh, field corn, canola, alfalfa, soybeans, papaya, only in the very slow southern parts of Florida, maybe California. And then, of course, cotton, BT cotton, very important, sugar beets. And you can see they have different traits. They have insect resistance. They have herbicide traits. They have stack traits. And so again, really pretty fascinating. Summer squash has been around and some, for somehow that kind of stayed under the radar. Of course, sweet corn, uh, most of our sweet corn now is BT. And so uh, again, insect tolerant. And some of our sweet corn is also herbicide tolerant, just like field corn. So again, we got, uh, and we got right now on US acreage, you can see those major players are 90% or above um, uh, in cotton, sugar beets, uh, soybeans, corn, and canola are, are all above 90% in use in the U.S. And so our farmers readily adopted these, these tools too. And we're willing to pay those technology fees um, that were considerable uh, at the time, but certainly much less than the, um, uh, than the use of the insecticide or herbicides that would have been needed for these crops. Um, given the, uh, the technological advancement. And, you know, keeping crops weed and insect free has really kind of broken that glass ceiling of yields again. So that we were, I remember in the, in the late 90s, agronomists were kind of fretting the fact that we weren't really pushing the yields, I mean, late 80s, weren't really pushing the yields above what we call the glass ceiling. And we broke the glass ceiling, we shattered it with these genetically engineered crops and the yields just keep going up. And so again, pretty fascinating. And, you know, I, I can remember growing corn back in the 80s and, and it never looked as beautiful as this genetically engineered crop that you see in front of your eyes that has both BT and gland Roundup Ready technology in it. Um, and it, the amazing thing is it looks that way all the way through the season. I mean, uh, you know, our corn would have been rat tattered and, and eaten and chewed on and corn borers. And when the tassels come out, they fell over and the corn looked pretty pretty shoddy up to the time of harvest. Same with our Roundup Ready bean technology. And now with the dicamba and 2,4-D resistant beans, um, you know, we can keep these things clean and they really are pretty, pretty amazing uh, uh, for our, our production. Again, breaking those glass ceilings and we can just see how beautiful these systems can be. And again, it's not just corn and soybeans. We're seeing biotech moving in more into the vegetable arena now with uh, 
was certainly was first with sweet corn and, and first with squash and sweet corn now potatoes and uh, we've actually tomatoes we had a tomato saver genetically modified tomato back in the 90s too that just fell out of favor no one seemed to want a, a tomato that hung around for for months on the counter they just kind of felt that, that was I guess strange in some way <laughs> but um, these new apples here the arctic apples which is really interesting um, they don't brown and so it's just it's turning off a genetic trait that causes browning it's a response to cutting and oxidation of the enzyme and so again it actually causes them to uh, be actually less prone to causing cancer imagine that you know when when, when a product browns when an apple browns uh, or potato browns when you cut it at that that, um, uh, that when that's cooked that, that creates compounds that actually um, can be uh, carcinogenic and so again, you actually turn that mechanism off. And so we don't typically what would have been done would be citric acid dips to keep that from occurring. And so now we can cut it and it's much safer for consumption. So again, that was pretty readily adopted by FDA. It wasn't a very hard sell. It came into the marketplace pretty easy. Most people don't even know what happened. So who are the big players in genetic and engineered crops? And that was uh, the US right from the beginning. You know, If we look at this in 2003, you can see the US was predominant in the world Argentina, Canada, Brazil, China, and South Africa. There's 11 um, countries in, actually, you no, know, 12 with Canada and, and 13 with us uh, countries. There's 11 in South America um, that have readily adopted genetically modified crops and are much moved much further ahead than we see in this chart in 2003. And uh, so, again, uh, uh, big players. And it really is being adopted around the world. Right now, the, the US is roughly about 40% of the total production in the world, Brazil comes up um, up there too as a major player, second second biggest Argentina. So we see this pie chart here. And it's, it's moving into smaller countries now and even, and even undeveloped countries now are adopting as some of the patent rights are falling off of this early technology. Um, it's coming to them um, cheap, free or cheap or very free. Um, so uh, again, pretty, pretty amazing to think that the world's going to be really moving fast into this and India is becoming a bigger player all the time. And so are the countries in Africa. We can see the adoption of these um, the crops as we go through the world. 28 and maybe more than that. This was in 2015. So it'd be interesting to see how it's changed since then. I haven't seen a report that, uh, that recently that has come out to kind of show, show this. But even, even this report now that's quite aged, we can see that we're moving the genetic engineering around the world. Um, and uh, really no, no um, no bans anymore. I don't think anyone bans now a genetically organized uh, uh, manipulated organism. So anyway, the, um, this is in Uganda. And here I'm sitting with uh, Chuck Schuster and my daughter, Abby. And we're talking to Ugandan farmers. And we were talking about, in the background there, you see bananas with uh, bacterial blight. And we're talking about the new banana that's been developed to actually be genetically engineered to overcome that. Coffee, there's a new coffee that's being developed that will genetically be engineered to overcome rust in coffee. Um, there's, so there's just, uh, of course, that we were talking about, um, we were actually talking about this pest right here, uh, where the farmer, um, I thought I had a slide there, the farmer that uh, we were looking at corn where they had a new pest there, corn um, armyworm. And it was new to that area in Uganda and had swept through from Tanzania and Kenya. And now they were, BT was the answer. That's what we were talking about. We were talking about, you're not going to spray your way out of this. It's going to be the uh, BT corn. It's going to be uh, used for that. There's in this, the trading store looking at the different chemistries there and the, we were talking a lot about uh, pesticide and safety of pesticides and we were also talking a lot about the advances in genetic science. Here's the picture I was looking for. There's the farmer. She's got that was a new pest for her and it was quite troublesome and we you know Chuck and I were talking about the idea that you know it wasn't going to be her spray in this field that's going to conquer this because she'd have to do it by hand. Can you imagine that? And it's going to be genetics built into the crop that takes care of that, just like we use in the U.S. So again, it really is pretty amazing. How about something like BioDirect? Have you heard about this? Uh, this was actually before Monsanto sold to Bayer, uh, a program that they were developing. It has to do with this new RNA interference, RNAi. And it talks about the role of against turning on and off genes based on this interference compound by, by inserting strands of RNAi that would actually interfere uh, with that replication process that you'd have to have at the ribosome. And so we got, um, I thought this, it also this nature video, there's some really great videos out there if you want to try to understand 
you know, how does RNA transcription and translation work in the, uh, and create a protein? And they got some really great, I like the nature videos. And they're kind of animated, but they kind of give you an idea of how it's being done. And it's just a, you know, fascinating um, look at, so they've got some really great nature videos on RNA and on, uh, on CRISPR technology. So I would, I would say, go out and take a look at that, those nature videos, just Google nature, RNA, and RNA, uh, um, uh, or, or CRISPR or what have you. Very interesting. Anyway, this um, BioDirect, I, I kind of pirated this uh, little talk here from this uh, uh, Australian scientist talking briefly about this BioDirect um, from Monsanto being the next big thing. It has to do with this RNA interference concept. And I, I liked his drawing, so I'm going to share some of his drawings here. You have, um, you have DNA, and of course, DNA... Um, and the transcription and of course RNA messenger RNA comes out, runs through the ribosome where we get translation and eventually a protein comes out. In this case, um, this RNA is coding for EPSPS enzyme. It's actually a protein that's required uh, by plants uh, for photosynthesis. And so that's uh, uh, EPSPS enzyme is what glyphosate inhibits. And so it's perfect. You know, you put our glyphosate on, it goes systemic in the plant. It binds this enzyme process, this protein Pro protein binds it so that essentially we stop a photosynthesis within the plant. And so there's enough glyphosate goes in the plant that we bind all that and we basically stop photosynthesis. That's how glyphosate works. So what happens if uh, we have a plant that has the ability to produce kind of a preponderance of our messenger RNA for this enzyme? And then we get so much enzyme in the plant that regardless of how much glyphosate we put in there, we don't stop the mechanism and we get photosynthesis and plant survives basically through a, a kind of the idea we just can't put enough glyphosate into the plant. And that's how we have resistance. And most of our plants out there that are resistant, this is the mechanism, just the overabundance of the plants we've selected for those plants that produce so much of this, this protein, uh, EPSPS, that we can't stop the function with the glyphosate. But what if we put um, uh, in, with, in with the glyphosate, and this is that biodirect concept, um, glyphosate plus um, an RNA interference um, uh, strand, and that would come in then, uh, we can see that if we added that in the spray water, if we could get that into the plant, and they actually have done it uh, at the experimental level, they just haven't figured out how to do it at the field level. But the idea that, that we can use that uh, RNA then to bind uh, with a number of those messenger RNAs before they run through the ribosome and essentially stop that extra production of EPSPS enzyme. And so again, we use that mechanism then as a kind of a a blocking mechanism for the production and the glyphosate works again. So essentially we switch off the plant's resistance mechanism, if you will. And so that's the concept of biodirect, working directly against the plant with something like uh, messenger RNA interference uh, technology. And so again, fascinating. What about Extendamax? And here's one of the most latest examples of dicamba. And I always like to know, how do they, how do, they do this? You know, the Roundup was done with a, the ballistics approach with a gene gun and they took the genes of a petunia and that were resistant to Roundup. They denatured these strands of DNA. They shot in very haphazardly with the gene gun, a lot of controversy about how effective it might be. And lo and behold, they finally got callous tissue in a Petri dish to be resistant to Roundup, accepted the genes. And so with, with this one here, Extendamax, how do they figure out dicamba kills beans? Dicamba is the product in, in Extendamax that would kill a bean outright dead uh, if it didn't have this gene transformation. Um, and so, and, and again, how, what do they do? How do they make it work? And it's actually done in Dr. Ronald, Donald Weeks' lab in the uh, University of Lincoln, Nebraska. He was licensed under Monsanto. Uh, he had realized that um, what, what di, uh, metabolizes dicamba, dicamba is a natural plant growth regulator. Um, it's a benzoic acid, so it's found naturally in the world. We just know that it can be used as a herbicide at higher rates. And so that's where dicamba fits in. We also know that dicamba does not persist in the soil. That, you know, four weeks, most of it's gone, sometimes less than two weeks, depending on the, the temperature of the soil and the activity of the biological community. And the mechanisms for its breakdown is actually it's a food source, the benzoic acid, is a food source for the bacteria Pseudomonas multifilia. And so Dr. Weeks knew that, of course, that wasn't, that was common knowledge for most people. They, we, we knew that benzoic acids were eaten by soil microbes. That's not new. But then Donald Weeks looked into the mechanism within the Pseudomonas multifilia that allowed it to eat the benzoic acid, to metabolize it, 
and he found the genetic material traits for that. And that's what was put in the soybeans. So now the soybeans metabolize the benzoic acid just as readily as the bacteria do um, as a food source. So that's pretty, that's pretty fascinating, isn't it? And put those genes or that bacteria into our soybeans to give them the ability then to tolerate not only glyphosate, but also the dicamba product clarity here. And so that was over at the Y in the early years of the trials before these products were released by Dr. Ron Witter, Ritter's work. And you can see how beautiful those fields were and how tolerant they were to something that would kill them dead, right? So again, that's just a quick dive into this topic and um, it gets more fascinating all the time. We can use this technology like forensics in the field now. You can go to AgDIA and buy immunostrip technology, a lysic test, uh, uh, these tests, the PCR test that can on the spot the, uh, determine exactly what is attacking your plant, just like you can go out and do the same thing with your uh, COVID test, right? And so we can, in the field now with these test kits, do amazing things uh, based on this, these genetic sciences that we have learned, uh, learned about. And uh, so again, Phytophthora, and fairly cheaply too, uh, 25 immunostrips for Phytophthora, $145. Anyone can order them. Then you can go out and cut a, cut a tissue sample in the field and check immediately for these, these diseases or traits. And actually here you can actually buy and test for BT, make sure the corn um, has BT and what BT uh, it expresses, what the event of uh, the uh, genetic insertion. Also, you can test kit for Roundup Ready. And so again, they, were, they developed these so that they could catch farmers cheap, right? <laughs> farmers reusing crop seeds. And so again, but we can use these too. And so again, these are really fascinating. Anyway, that's where GMO is kind of being and maybe a little insight as to where it's going. The, the, how fast this, this science has developed is, is uncanny. And I'm going to stop sharing. We're going to pull back into our, uh, our uh, regular deck view. Great to see everyone here this morning. Um, Anyway, that, I'm going to stop the recording here, too, and uh, we're going to go ahead and go into discussion. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed that little journey uh, with uh, some of the genetic traits that have been developed. <laughs>